Um, I'm going to kind of uh, subject you to what I subject uh, my students to. Um, I found uh, that um, coming to teach uh, here, um, confronted with uh, teaching students that were, to me, shockingly uh, growing up in the eighties. Uh, you'll look the old here, but I thought uh, significantly that for me meant that um, the students who I was presenting with these images to kind of put in their face uh, were um, uh, children of not the environmental crisis per se, but an environmental reality. Uh, but still, like, um, for me, many of the students um, were. Um, <coughs> Many of the landscapes I was showing via photography, uh, photographers were still removed uh, from some of these, um, uh, these realities out there. And I was purposely putting things in your face, like, um, um, like this soda. Um, so for many, uh, for many years, um, I, I would start with an image like this uh, to seduce my students. Uh, first with this, you know, amber glow of uh, pretty sunny composition of earth, light, and shadow. And first, you know, as landscape students, they, you know, kind of see that glow and they'd start to swoon. And then they would get, you know, as they made about the, um, uh, the figure of this uh, dead horse. Um, and uh, this, um, haunting uh, close-up is actually um, uh, only one example of a whole canon of uh, work that emerged, as you can see, in the history of, um, uh, of environmental crisis in the uh, 70s and, and 80s. Um, and by a generation of very pioneering uh, photographers um, who have been recording um, this environmental devastation. And again, I was always interested in how they were uh, portraying this uh, uh, environmental devastation, if it was provocation, pure documentation. So I, I was using your pictures and still do as uh, to my own pedagogical advantage, um, showing aspiring landscape architects and other um, students who would dare come and uh, be contaminated. Um, uh, that we got the beauty often coexist with um, impulsive reality, um, and that. My ploy was about putting these in plain view. Um, often, like Ansel Adams, bringing distant landscapes into view, um, that these troubled landscapes uh, would enter their consciousness so they could imagine a, um, a course of environmental action. Um, uh, I purposely uh, would burst their little pastoral landscape bubble uh, to make the point, as C.J. Gould has, uh, has in writing about contemporary landscape photography, book, we have managed to intrude upon nature to the point where an aesthetic of romantic wilderness simply will not do as the philosophy of landscape. Uh, though um, there is the history of the picturesque and the sublime, as caught by Ansel Adams, that they must know by heart um, and recognize in landscapes um, like these. Um, a kind of cheap shot uh, here of a, a similar uh, view by Bertinsky. But this was so that they can see how um, this next generation of photographies replace off um, with revulsion, majesty with horror, um, inspiration with con confrontation, and unspoiled scenery with tableau of text, toxic beauty. Uh, in fact, you know many of the uh, temporary artists that we've been uh, uh, looking at, um, at looking at the New West, uh, deliberately followed in the uh, blueprints of Adams and his 19th century um, predecessors, but instead of carefully cropping these scenes um, of mountains and regal valleys, uh, the next generation disturbed uh, their depiction of the Wild West, venturing perhaps to the other side of the mountain to find it hollowed out um, for precious metals. So while the senior Adams championed the preservation of America's national treasures, the photographers looking at the New West 
pose the landscape not as a neutral territory, but as contested ground. Um, this body of work, as uh, other folks have mentioned, uh, uh, gained significant attention in the mid-70s through the exhibit of new topographics, uh, photographs of man altered landscapes uh, that featured the work of Robert um, Adams, um, no relationship, uh, no relation, um, and others. Um, there were a range of tactics and motivations that the photographers were using, and this is what I asked my students to kind of interrogate. Um, and uh, so some of them were known as, as very cool and detached, um, almost you know, scientific in their documentation of the landscape, and um, others were seen as anthropological rather than critical um, and oblique in their terms of judgments or opinions. But in any case, the pictures all had, and they still have, um, moral and political implications, whether <coughs> overt or obscure. Um, the work which, um, uh, which coincided with the proliferation of environmental protection um, legislation, I always make the point of that maybe before they were born, there was all this uh, legislation that actually you know, came into being and it's still pretty recent. Um, and it, uh, they visualized the environmental crisis, which was still invisible to many, um, or at least unacknowledged. Uh, and uh, a lot of folks were still, a lot of uh, larger public, um, were unwilling to see their place uh, in these sometimes horrifying landscape portraits. Um, uh, pointing out that uh, this um, device that David Hansen used of uh, using the USGS map, um, and I know this is a uh, we, we shout, but in fact, um, that area that he outlining appears white on the map and on the ground the reality um, is that so they were uh, students were always um, told to not trust Max um, so in this case I'm quoting this rap here quote the issues of landscape extend beyond the frame the landscape photograph is not an autonomous aesthetic object to be understood on the basis of formal innovation visceral power or conceptual insight, it also carries weighty cultural baggage that no longer can be ignored. Um, the exhibit uh, gave way to a number of photographs whose points of views were widely varied. Uh, some of the artists, um, uh, Emmett Gowan, uh, took to the air uh, to apprehend expanses of altered terrain that were out of some of our other views you know, of um, not being able to get up in your plane. This advantageous abstraction of land seen from great heights lures us as viewers into thinking the artificial patterns and man-made formations are perhaps uh, part of the native geomorphology. But the viewer forms an entirely different opinion um, with the realization that such things as nuclear bombs uh, and mine killings have altered uh, this terrain. So, um, if beauty uh, is a strategy of persuasion, uh, then these uh, contemporary landscape photographers' attention to environmental awareness uh, may be um, as convincing as Adam's photos were uh, to the previous century's conservation movement. And again, um, uh, I don't quite know um, what this is unless I can read um, the title. So meanwhile, at somewhat lower the elevations, contemporary landscape uh, photographers have broken with at the Adams family sorry, tradition of carefully uh, cropping their portrayals of America the Beautiful, um, editing the, um, that they were, they were editing impurities from the supposed pristine scene. Um, in this case, uh, these photographers, their scenery include us. Uh, residing uncomfortably close to uh, belching, supersized industry. Um, the viewer is confronted with an involuntary yes in my backyard. Um, artist David Hansen's and juxtaposition of modest company houses with gigantic power plants. Um, I often would say, this film's happening uh, around here, that somewhere in that photograph, Aaron Brockovich um, <laughs> is somewhere there reporting who, who is downwind down the street. 
Um, Hansen is joined by other photographers, like you're going to disclose the invisibility um, of pollution by juxtaposing uh, text, labeling, labeling the beloved landscape type, um, like an orchard, on top of its painful demise. Um, its cause of death revealed uh, with accompanying text that he um, uh, has next to the photograph, noting its location in uh, radioactive uh, territory. Um, a, a, a photographer who uses similar tactic of this photo juxtaposed with text. Um, the photo here by Joan, uh, Joe Sternville uh, positions sometimes these relatively uh, innocent looking uh, subjects opposite the plain facts about the menacing consequences of industrial activity, and in this case, um, the nature of the United States Army's uh, business in Hanford, Washington. So the text next to it um, uh, uh, enumerates the statistics um, about the production of 440 billion gallons of chemical and radioactive waste poured into the ground, including uh, pollution uh, to build two nuclear, uh, two dozen nuclear bombs, and then all without warning, um, warnings about potential hazards to local residents. For me, uh, these, uh, this tactic used by these um, artists fill the gap between what we see and what we know. Uh, artists like uh, uh, Bertinsky frame giant big heaps of stuff that at first glance um, might look like giant land, uh, frame landforms, but with closer inspection reveals distinctly unnatural scenes. A mountain of uh, tires, perhaps one can say, the geology of consumption. Um, and this tactic of masking, unmasking environmental consequences and cultural implications of a still frame effectively puts suspect processes into motion um, and into question. These are images, um, these are images of monstrous impact um, our very, of our earthly desires um, that make um, for these otherworldly landscapes. So um, I tell the students and remind us all that like it or not, we are no longer innocent bystanders. Uh, my very media blast students um, uh, uh, born uh, head on into um, environmental crisis or environmental reality may uh, still cling to that family trip to Yosemite, um, but uh, they also take the, um, uh, at the same time, they're taking the earth um, as a, the polluted earth as a given, but still, uh, I like to put these photographs in their face to, you know, ask questions. Um, so as I continue to project these images of that difficult certainty, um, I, I kind of look for their reaction. Um, and some uh, of this um, attraction turned repulsion uh, triggers this range of reactions I find from a resigned shrug of the shoulders like, you know, duh, you know, this is what we're surrounded with, but also to uh, boiling mad uh, looks in their faces. Um, so again, my ploy as a teacher may emulate the uh, environmentalist author, Kerry Tempest Williams, who begs the question, quote, do we dare to look ourselves in the eye and begin the necessary work of repentance and restoration? But I have to say, um, uh, I and I suspect some of these uh, uh, photographers are not um, ready to force anyone into a confessional. Um, and, uh, and then certainly owning up to um, our role in ecological devastation and its social penalty, penalties is warranted, but I think how we ask for, for, for forgiveness is up for debate. Um, uh, again, I'm sure restoration is imperative maybe for the toxic landscapes that are poisoning us. Um, but uh, I wonder if there's another version, um, albeit maybe a little perverse, um, on the land uh, conversation, uh, conversation, uh, conservation movement championed by Ansel Adams. Um, so are these photographers presenting us with an industrial legacy um, to be internalized or um, to recalibrate our idea of our own and do the photographs um, capture environmental consequences to allow us time to contemplate um, how we may coexist with this troublesome um, version of our nature? 
So um, we are uh, very indebted, I think, to these intrepid photographers looking at the New West, as well as the Rust Belts and um, uh, contaminated quarries, corridors east of Mississippi. And also, I think, for, again, bringing uh, distant um, uh, landscapes into view um, around the globe to portray very distant victims um, of our consumerist demands and our unconscious desires with these ingeniously crafted images um, of picturesque awe and very sublime horror. Um, and uh, I think we can keep uh, these photographs of troubled beauty in their frames and at a distance, um, or we can look um, closer and with maybe some peripheral uh, vision uh, and wonder and about what we have done and what we do next.